Welcome to Food Revolution Conversations, where we explore healthy, ethical, and sustainable food for all. Welcome to this Food Revolution Conversation. I'm Ocean Robbins, co-founder and CEO of Food Revolution Network. And we are here today to talk about healthy, ethical, sustainable food for all and what it takes to get to the for all part of that mission. And we're gonna look at food and equity and opportunity with a deep dive into a very specific community that has a very profound significance in my heart and life and also in our national story in the United States. That community is Selma, Alabama, birthplace of the voting rights movement. The place where in 1965 on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, demonstrators were beaten as they sought to peacefully march for the right to vote. People died that day. Selma became a flashpoint for a national movement. And to this day, every single year, there is a bridge crossing jubilee on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I've been honored to go a couple of times where people march across that bridge to ceremonially represent the journey from slavery to freedom, from disenfranchisement to empowerment and leadership and building a brighter future. And two of the people who have been such uh, inspirations to me in my understanding of the dynamics of race and class and power and freedom in the United States and in the world are Malika Sanders Fortier and Ayinka Sanders Jackson. Their family has been leading the civil rights struggle for many decades. They probably both uh, attended rallies in the womb. They grew up in this struggle and now they are leading it forward. And uh, they're dear friends of mine. I've been so blessed to do some deep work, particularly with Malika, but with both of them over the years and to know their their spirits, their passion for justice and freedom and love and liberation for all beings. And uh, so it's an incredible honor to have this time to catch up with two old friends and also to bring their wisdom to you. Let me tell you a little bit about these amazing people. So Ayinka Sanders Jackson is the executive director of the Selma Center for Nonviolence, Truth and Reconciliation at Healing Waters Retreat Center in Selma, Alabama. She's a co-founder of the Nashville Campaign to End the New Jim Crow. She's helped organize mass incarceration forums for judicial district attorney and mayoral candidates. She was the vice president of the Children's Defense Fund Nashville Freedom School Partnership Board and also a leader on the Criminal Justice Mass Incarceration Task Force for Nashville, organized for action and hope. And she's presented at the largest mayoral forum Nashville has ever held. Malika Sanders Fortier serves as state senator for the state of Alabama. She represents District 23. She's an attorney for her family's groundbreaking law office, Chestnut Sanders and Sanders, former executive director of the 21st Century Youth Leadership Movement. She got her BA from Spelman College and her law degree from Birmingham School of Law. So that's a little bit about their sort of professional background and what they are up to. Malika, Ayinka, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Well, I am thrilled to be here with you. And, uh, you know, let's start by talking a little bit about where you are. You are in Selma, Alabama right now. And it's a very significant place in our national journey. Can you tell us a little bit about what Selma means to you? Yes, um, I, I'll start in the context of sharing about the current organization that I direct, the Selma Center for Nonviolence, Truth and Reconciliation, um, which Malika uh, and others helped to co-found uh, in 2015 amidst the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday and the Selma to Montgomery March. That weekend when people were here from all over the world, different parts of the country, President Obama was here. The KKK allegedly distributed 30,000 recruitment flyers. Uh, we had two murders that Sunday, two more within less than a month in a town that's less than 20,000 people. Wow. 2014, our county was the poorest county in the state. 2015, Selma was the most dangerous place to live in Alabama. And in 2016, it was the eighth most dangerous place per capita in the whole country. It's just insane. So this, this place where nonviolence overcame violence um, was considered the eighth most dangerous place per capita in the country. We believe that broken relationships 
between communities have led to broken economies, leading to broken communities, all in need of healing. And so our, our founders came together and said that we needed to address violence in all its forms, whether it be racial, whether it be physical, or whether it be economic violence. And we actually we often don't think of poverty as being a form of violence, but we believe that things that dehumanize others uh, is, is violent. And so uh, Dr. Bernard Lafayette, who was a, a leader in the National Citizens, the Freedom Rise and Selma Movement, uh, and who Dr. King appointed to be over the Poor People's Campaign, uh, who is also our board chair and a co-founder. In our very first board meeting, he said that there was unfinished business in the Civil Rights Movement, and we needed a Selma II. So we say Selma 2.0, finishing the unfinished business of bridging uh and building the beloved community. And I'm so grateful to be a partner in this building and being the beloved community with my sister here in Selma. <laughs> well, I'm getting chills. Selma 2.0, we've got some unfinished business to take care of, don't we? Well, thank you so much for leading that forward. Malika, anything you wanna add about what Selma means to you? So, you know, Ocean, you and me and Selma go way back. <laughs> yes. Uh, we have talked about Selma over the decades at this point, not even one decade anymore. Ocean has been decades. I think it's been maybe a couple of decades since you even came here or close to the first time you came to Selma. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, from the first moment, I think that we've talked, I have shared my um, concern about, um, about a sense of unity and, and justice and mercy and forgiveness um, with, for in Selma. Um, and really just believe that that's connected to our nation's consciousness, right? Um, in 1965, uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, did a speech uh, in a joint session of Congress um, presenting the 1965 Voting Rights Bill. And um, he did that right after the Selma to Montgomery March and right after the murder of Reverend James Reeb here in Selma. Um, and in it, he, he talks about the soul of a nation, right? Um, he, he compares it with uh, the soul of a man, right? That you can, you can gain the whole world, you can have military might and you can have wealth and you can have all kinds of things. But um, if you forsake your soul, what do you really have uh, is the question he raises. It's, it's really powerful because I really do think that in that moment, you kind of see Selma, uh, the soul of Selma being connected to the soul of the nation. And so when, when we fight for the beloved community here in Selma, we don't just do it for Selma. We do it for our nation. We do it for, for the country and we do it um, for our families and our community um, and for all that we hold, hold dear. Which is really important because when we think about for liberty and justice for all, when think, we think about those words and, and your mission that relates to for all, um, you know, in, in many ways, we, we, I believe that we've never been a United States of America. And, and Selma really uh, symbolizes that in that bridge, right? Edmund Pettus yes. was a um, grand uh, dragon of the KKK. His name is on there, right? Uh, and it and and so it's like this civil war and civil rights embodied in this one um, um, historic structure that, and people often don't know, Selma didn't just change the world in 1965. Um, Within a week of the Civil War's ending, when the Union soldiers took over Selma, because Selma was such a stronghold for the Confederacy, making most of the uniforms and artillery only next to Richmond, Virginia, when Selma was taken over, literally within a week, the war is over. And so, you know, it has often been a stronghold, and that bridge has been a stronghold, is why the League of the South has considered a hate group two years ago did a flash mob on the bridge right and so you know we never had any truth and reconciliation after the civil war and civil rights and people are really holding on um to that pain uh, and we haven't healed and that's really necessary for us to move forward uh to be a united states of america yes. uh and so it can be for liberty and justice for all 
You know, as you were just talking, I was thinking about this sort of false dichotomy that we see between what I'll call the Black Lives Matter movement and the All Lives Matter message. And uh, recently in Food Revolution Network, we came out with a very, you know, forthright statement about why we support Black lives and that Black lives matter in this world. And it was stunning to me how many people responded with All Lives Matter as if they were contradicting us. And it seems to me that, that of course, all lives matter and we're not acting like it right now because, <laughs> because as a nation, we're not acting like black lives matter. And so if we really want all lives to matter, then let's start paying some attention to the lives that are being disrespected and disregarded by policies, by practices that continue to impoverish communities and people across this nation. And I see you all standing for that in a way that is about the beloved community. So you're standing for boldly for saying, look what's going on here, right? This is wrong. And you're also doing it in a way that's so welcoming and embracing and inclusive. And you know that to me is the legacy that, that we have all been blessed with from the civil rights movement is to show that you really can nonviolently stand for something beautiful in a way that challenges injustice boldly and yet does so in a way that invites everybody to reclaim their humanity as a participant in that movement rather than creating more of the the violence and separation that just creates more enemies i think abraham lincoln said the best way to destroy an enemy is to make them a friend and that's something i've always felt coming from you all uh, in your work it's so interesting because uh, dr king has a similar quote um, that talks about friendship and that talks about um, turning an enemy into a friend. But he also has a quote that, that says that, that hate can't drive out hate, only love can do that. Um, darkness can't drive out darkness, only light can do that. And so I think um, it's critical in this moment, in this very critical moment, that we embrace the light, that, that we manifest the light, that we be a light to one another. And I just want to read one other quote from Dr. Clint King. It actually is on the shirt that I'm wearing today. It says, the end of violence or the aftermath of violence is bitterness. The aftermath of nonviolence is reconciliation and the creation of a beloved community. The end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. Mm. And so nonviolence really, really helps us to create the beloved community. And you can't... Um, you can't create it if you're not being it, right? We often say that the beloved community is not just a destination, but it's a journey. Yes, thank you. Chills again. Uh, I wanna tie this into food and health because of course that's our mission in Food Revolution Network. And it does tie in uh, statistically in the United States, the darker your skin color, uh, the more likely you are to be a victim, of course, of police violence, and also the more likely you are to grow up poor, to be denied loans and promotions and housing opportunities, to be impacted by redlining, and to live in a community with polluted air and water. Also, the more likely you are to lack access to nutritious and healthy food and to suffer from obesity and type two diabetes and hypertension and heart disease and all of the other chronic ailments that are so prevalent today. And now here we are in the time of COVID-19, black Americans are dying of COVID-19 at three times the rate of white Americans. It seems like the people who can least afford it are being the most impacted as is so often the case when challenges hit our society. And at Food Revolution Network, our mission again is healthy, ethical, sustainable food for all. And so we want to shift some of these dynamics. And I would love your insight um, into what are the barriers that we must overcome? I think they're fairly obvious, but more importantly, what can we do? How do we address some of the root causes so that we address this health disparity and this opportunity disparity. I mean, there's, there's the old saying that a person with their health has a thousand dreams. A person without it has but one dream and that's to get it back. You know, when you're suffering, when you're hurting, when you're exhausted, when you're full of brain fog, when you're in crisis, 
then you don't think long-term. You think in survival reaction mode. And that impacts your ability to prepare for the future. It impacts your ability to go to college. It impacts your ability to save. You know, you don't save water when your house is on fire. And a lot of people are in that kind of crisis reaction mode, which impacts the ability of future generations to get a head start. So in that context, uh, how, how do you, what do you think we can do? So, you know, I, I want to go straight to, you know, that, that question, but I think some context would be helpful first. So this pandemic, um, not the one about poverty, not the one about racism, but coronavirus. Um, so we have this triple pandemic that is happening. There was an article in the New York Times that showed um, the places that were at most at risk um, for um, having major consequences to the communities based on their health. Yes. And 12 places, seven of them were in the Black Belt of Alabama. And Malika wow. represents the Black Belt. Uh, and Selma is within the Black Belt. So seven out of 12, and Selma was number five. This is important for many reasons. Um, one, um, we're a part of an organization called Girl Trek that encourages Black women to walk, like take a Harriet track is what they trick is what they say. You know, walk to save yourself, come back to get others. And they have a, a TED talk that talks about how racism is killing Black women. Because this is important because if you if you level the playing field with um, you're eating right, you're exercising, education, all those things, we still don't fare as well because of the stress of racism. Yes. Um, one of the things that the center has been doing during this um, pandemic, um, we're not a direct service organization, but we have had to do certain things because people are even more in crisis. I had long heard about the food insecurity uh, in Selma, but I literally had no idea like how bad it was, right? If I look around and I really paid attention, right? I, I would know that we have food deserts, right? That they, there are places um, and we don't have public transportation, which makes it worse. So yeah. if, if you only have grocery stores on the far sides of town and no transportation to get there, it's really, really problematic. So we start giving out fresh food, um, produce, right? So we're talking about zucchini and squash, not cereal, sugary cereals, any of that. And we start giving it out at 12 o'clock. By eight something, people are already lined up to get it hours in advance for zucchini and squash. Mm. And the first time that that happened, because it happens every time, I was so... Um, it just hit me in such a hard way to see people literally so hungry for food that for hours they waited for it. And so uh, the, the food insecurity here is um, extremely, extremely high. Yes. So um, this is definitely a challenge uh, here in, in Dallas County where Selma is located. Um, but I would say even more so in some of the other rural counties that I represent. Um, you know, at least there's a grocery store or two or three here, but I, there are little towns that I represent, there's no grocery store. Um, you know, there are stores that don't carry any fresh fruits or vegetables. Um, and so this is a, this is a major challenge. And, and part of why it's heartbreaking um, is because the one thing we have in the Black Belt uh, are people and land. And so, um, but, but there's been a whole mindset um, that I think, um, you know, has, has made a situation or helped to create a situation that really doesn't have to be. Um, and so part of our desire in building the beloved community is for people to really embrace um, embrace the land, you know, embrace the, what we have been given, the blessings that, that we've been given, um, and to work together and to heal together, um, and, and to make things better, um, you know, for ourselves in relationship and in partnership with others, because we have land, well, we really, um, are, are passionate and excited about building a, a cooperative, 
a food cooperative, um, farming and, and gardening and doing those kinds of things that can help to, um, to fill in the, the void uh, of healthy, healthy foods. Mm, beautiful. Recently, I got to interview uh, Le- Leah Penniman, the co-founder of Soulfire Farm in upstate New York. And she's the author of Farming While Black. One of the things she actually dedicated her book to her great, 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 many generations back grandmothers who braided seeds into their hair before they boarded slave ships because they wanted to symbolically and practically bring, that was the one thing they were trying to take with them that they could take was the relationship to seeds for the future and history and the the ancestral knowledge of how to grow food. And when I think about the centuries of forced relationship with the land, uh, enslavement was all about agriculture. And, um, and of course, centered in the South where you all are based. And I think about what it means, what, what journey it must be to overcome that legacy, to reclaim relationship to the earth again. And I wonder if, if that's something that you resonate with. Is that something that you feel is an important piece to work on in your community? It's so important, but it's also so hard. Uh, we just were across the river and uh, across the bridge and saw cotton. And Malika looked at, at it, in my head, looked at it with beauty. And all I could think was pain in the moment. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, if I, who am working with this stuff to try to bring it about, my first feeling is pain um, and flashbacks <laughs> yes. um, that didn't happen to me directly, um, then there's a lot of healing that has to take place in order for that to happen. Um, but like Malika said, the black belt, two of the greatest resources we have are the people and the land. And so yes. we have to do some healing um, and some tilling <laughs> um, to, to be able uh, to center that. You know, um, at the turn of the century, of the last century, black farmers held about 14% of the land in the United States. By the end of the century, it was around one point. One percent or something. They lost ninety-three percent of their land in the course of the of the twentieth century, and that wasn't by chance. And it wasn't just because people stopped wanting to do it. A lot of it was because of preferential loan treatment from the USDA, explicitly favoring white farmers over black farmers who had the same economic condition in the same land, they would give loans to the white farmer over the black farmer. And this became so systemic and so pervasive that it led to massive loss of land and livelihood. Um, Your family's law firm, which I believe you still work at Malika, um, in addition to your senatorial duties, um, is, has been a, uh, one of the leaders in addressing this and actually led the lawsuit, I believe, against the USTA to try to create some accountability. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, we were one of the, the firms that took this on. Um, the Chestnut in Chestnut Sanders and Sanders is uh, J.L. Chestnut, who um, was Dr. King's attorney when he would come to Selma, um, has a long history in civil rights. Uh, I think he was the first black African-American attorney in Selma. Um, we're trying to get the courthouse named after him even now. And uh, he was one of the major leaders of the lawsuit, uh, along with my father, Hank Sanders. Um, and, you know, so they went over, all over the Black Belt, all over the South, all over the country, really, signing up farmers because um, after all of that time, farmers were actually able um, to, to um, get a judgment and begin um, to kind of recover from the loss of all of that land. And so the Black Farmers case was one way of, you know, chipping, chipping away um, at that pain, chipping away at that injustice so that we could um, begin to reclaim not just the land physically, but the the sense of value for the land. Yes, you know it seems to me that over the over the de- centuries, really, white supremacy has had to become more covert in order to stay in operation. And some of the most blatant forms of racism have become unacceptable 
in our society as we've evolved. You know, we no longer think, most of us, that it's okay to discriminate on the basis of skin color. Now, it still happens all the time, but we, we don't think it's a good idea. And no one wants to admit it publicly for the most part, except for very extreme groups. Obviously you deal with some of those groups in your community who are not afraid to speak it publicly. But in the larger national conversation, we don't want to admit that there's racism at all in some cases, right? And we like to think of it like it's in the past. Really the Black Lives uh, Matter plea for help is really an American call for help, right? Our country is is uh, not well, we are not whole, we are not okay, right? Um, and we must be, we need to heal together, we need to listen to each other, we need to, to love each other, we need to be patient with one another, we need to work through these issues and really find solutions together because a lot of these issues are very nuanced, right? I mean, you know, uh, police officers have a very dangerous job right? Going into places with people they don't know. Um, it's understandable that they're on guard, right? Um, and at the same time, while they need to be protected, we, that protection cannot be uh, over and above the protection of regular citizens, right? It, it has to go um, hand in hand. We have to have solutions that take into account the needs of the whole. And, and we just believe that in the beloved community, there's a win-win uh, construct, right? It doesn't have to be you lose, I win. And for so long, even from the inception of slavery um, and, and the slave, and the, the economy of slavery, right? There was this win lose, right? We need to win, so you get to lose. And the question is, how do we shift that in every system and in every institution um, so that it's not based on a win lose or a lose win, but it is based on a win win and, 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 and it's founded on love. So that's what the beloved community is all about. How do you create institutions and systems that are based on love for all, for all? <laughs> and this is important because you're, you're coming about it being an American thing and not just a black thing because our liberation is tied up into one another, right? You can't be free, Ocean, if we're not free. There's yeah. a part when, when people dehumanize others, it dehumanizes themselves, right? And it's different when you see yourself in this, right? That, that we are so tied and connected that I'm not just doing this for you, I'm doing this for us. Like that my family, my community, our economy, our um, um, mental health issue, everything depends on how we are together. Yes. And so, you know, when I see it that way, then I'm not just an ally, but I become a co-liberator, <laughs> right? <laughs> We are so connected right. and tied together that both of our lives are dependent upon this. And so when you view it as that, you're all in, right? It's not just sometimes, it's not just a petition, like your life is committed um, to saving your life <laughs> and the lives of, of, of those who are mm. uh, in the community as well. I just had this thought of this, um, this trajectory from um, hostility to ambivalence to allyship, to collaboratory, to collaborator, as a journey of what it really means to take a stand with our lives and go move from the, the status quo, which in many cases has created outright hostility to the dignity and well being of humans, to ambivalence, which unfortunately perpetuates more of the same given the context we're starting from and have all been born into to allyship where it's like, oh, let me help you and I'm in service to you, which is I think really important as a step for sure. But then co-liberation is like, how do we really create the beloved community and how do we get our hands dirty? You know, how do we, how do we show up in this? You know, as recognizing that our liberations are interconnected and that, that's what's so moving to me about the spirit you're standing for and why I think this is important. Not This isn't just a Selma conversation, although Selma is critically important. This isn't even just a national conversation. This is a human conversation. What kind of people are we going to be? What kind of legacy will we leave for future generations? And uh, we're at a point in history, I think, where, where silence or turning away is no longer an option. If we care about the legacy of future generations because we can see where the status quo leads and it's not pretty, but we can also see something else is possible and you all are lighting the way for that. Uh, I have one more question and then I wanna kind of move towards wrapping here. Um, 
Malika, you've been vegetarian, I believe, for as long as I've known you. Um, variations, mostly well, plant-based, however you think of it. And I'm curious uh, if that is connected to your values around social justice or how it ties to what we're talking about today. I went to college um, in Atlanta, Georgia, and there is when I learned about being a vegetarian and, and what that meant. And I think it's because, you know, at the deepest levels of who we are, you know, in our spirit, we we know we know life right life knows life and yeah. so when we when we when we violate that um it can be a slippery slope and so um i uh so in that sense i didn't have an analysis right um way back then but i really did have um just sort of at a gut level as a as a young person um a discomfort with anything that, um, that snuffed out life. I think at a very gut level, um, just, you know, it's so important that we, that we have a healthy respect for life, for all living things, you know? Um, yeah. Because if you have a respect for all living things and you honor uh, and respect all living things, then it becomes so much harder to cause harm, uh, even when you're angry, or even when you're upset, or even when you've been wronged, or even when there's an injustice, right? Um, you know, I think that this is a moment that is very important, that is very important that we all have an increased sense of honor and respect for all life. Yes, thank you for that. So true. Um, our mutual friend, Kumba Toure from Mali, West Africa, uh, said to me once, all violence begins with disconnection. And the moment you disconnect with somebody, it becomes possible to commit any level of violence from ignoring somebody or disrespecting them or not listening to them all the way through to murder. Because all of those are gradients and they all start from a root place of disconnection where we cease to recognize the inherent dignity, the inherent worthiness of another being. And what I really hear you saying is that for you, animals became a part of your ecosystem of life. And you didn't want to take that life if you didn't need to. And, you know, everyone has their own sensibilities around food and where we draw those lines, right? For some people, you know, even vegetables have screams, you know, and to, to other people, uh, you know, they feel like they would not be a cannibal, right? But they would say that eating monkeys is okay. And, you know, we all have some place, I think, in the spectrum of our own sense of sensibility of what is us, what is me, what is the community that I'm going to call part of me, and where will I draw that line? And uh, in my work, I want to help us expand our circle of compassion in every respect, in our food choices, in our life choices, in how we show up in the world, because I think that our humanity is deepened when we do so. And I have a lot of respect and a lot of compassion for everybody drawing that line in the way that makes sense for them. And I do wanna challenge all of us to think about it because when we have animals being tortured in factory farms, I think that the act of consuming flesh from that system uh, desensitizes us to violence of all kinds. And I wanna help us become more sensitive and more attuned so that we can become more effective in doing something different. Well, we're nearing the end of our time here for this conversation. And I'd love to hear from each of you if you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share as we move towards completion here. Um, Malika, how about you first and then Ayinka? Um, well, one, I just wanna say thank you so much, Ocean, for inviting us and we've just kind of we're just very spiritually connected and so um we just believe that there that that that, that um that god is doing something really amazing in heaven and we just have to walk it out here on earth and so we're excited about doing that with this food cooperatives we're excited about doing that in healing relationships um you know in the state senate the, quite a bit of the work that i've been doing is around bringing democrats and republicans together um for these healing conversations to love with love on one another because i really do believe that our solutions will come um best when we are walking working hand in hand together deeply listening to one another and and loving one another and this is a moment in our history where uh, that is calling and screaming for solutions and i believe love is the foundation of those oh bless you thank you Ayinka. 
I was speaking to a, a, a top law enforcement person in the state yesterday uh, about um, law enforcement and violence inflicted. And I talked about like that disconnection, not seeing themselves in that person or not seeing the God in that person. It's so easy to do things, right? It's why when someone attacks you, they said, look them in the eye, tell them about your family, ask about their, like to get a connection. Yes. And so we are all walking around in this country disconnected because we have had a value system that says me, myself, and I, instead of we, right? And we means us, right? That there's a connection here. Um, um, Desmond Tutu said, that the the that America doesn't even have the language for truth and reconciliation. He talked about Ubuntu, which is, means I am because you are. Uh, and so I, like that is connection that we can build upon. And so my challenge with people is to get connected, right? Mm -hmm. Use your life, labor, um, help me out, labor, influence, finances, and expertise. Labor, influence, finances, and expertise. Life connected with someone and so whether that's you getting connected with us in Selma or getting connected with your neighbor next door that you don't know their name get and stay connected beautiful well we really are right here talking about reconnecting ourselves with our basic humanity with our place in the larger ecosystem. You, you, I see you embodying that in politics, embodying that in relationships between law enforcement and community, embodying that in looking at food and economic opportunity. And, uh, you know, self, Selma, uh, the birthplace of the voting rights movement has brought more freedom and more opportunity to so many. And I think that Selma 2.0 is going to bring uh, a kind of peace that comes from that connection. Not a peace that is complicity with a toxic status quo, but a kind of peace that comes from knowing our humanity, building real relationships, built on trust and mutual self-interest and collective well-being. And I thank you so much for the courage, the love, the, the integrity you're bringing. I can only imagine with all that you've seen, uh, and all that you've faced in your lives, how easy it would be to have anger and uh, a cynicism take over. And yet I feel such a steady return to that commitment to love and true nonviolence embodied in your work. And it's palpable, it's profound, it's beautiful. And for all of us food revolutionaries who may be working in a different space, let's remember this message today and let's put it into action in our lives whatever circle you walk in wherever you work whatever you do whoever you interact with let's take something that we've learned from these sisters and put it into action in our lives malika Ayinka, thank you so much thank you <laughs>